Welcome, everyone. We have over 500 participants logged into the audience today. My name is Dr. Doug White, editor of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, and I'm the moderator for today's webinar entitled Impact of Rapid Molecular Diagnostics and Antibiotic Stewardship Programs in the Treatment of Bloodstream Infections. Before we begin, though, let me remind the audience that we will have a question and answer session following the presentations, and you can submit questions throughout the presentation. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask a Question button on the right-hand corner of your screen. I would encourage you to input questions as and when you think of them. This will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end. The more questions asked, the better the session will become. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's two speakers. Russ Judd received his doctor of pharmacy degree in residency training at the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. He has served as the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program Coordinator at St. Joseph Hospital since 2009. His practice interests include antimicrobial resistance, rapid molecular diagnostics, as well as management of sepsis and septic shock. Among his many accolades is a Special Achievement Award from the Kentucky Society of Health Systems Pharmacists. Christian Timbach is an antimicrobial stewardess pharmacist at the University of Utah. Dr. Timbach received his PharmD and MBA from Sullivan University in Louisville, Kentucky. He completed his residency and infectious diseases pharmacy residency at the Medical University of South Carolina. He then went on to complete an Infectious Disease Outcomes Fellowship in Antimicrobial Stewardship at the Providence, Rhode Island, VA. His clinical research interests include integrations of rapid diagnostics and antimicrobial stewardship, comparative effectiveness research, and medical informatics. Dr. Kimbrook is an active member of several professional organizations, including the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Society of Micro Microbiology, Making a Difference in Infectious Diseases Program, and the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists. And without further hesitation, I'd like to hand the speaking chip over to Dr. Judd to begin his presentation. Okay, thank you, Dr. White. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Elsevier and BioFire for the opportunity to speak on World Sepsis Day. And all of the initiatives that I'll describe at the end of the presentation are really a collaborative effort between myself and Dr. Kennedy, who serves as our ID physician champion, as well as our infection control team, who I really can't say enough about. But early detection and treatment of uh, sepsis and other invasive fungal infections has really been a major focus of our organization over the past six to seven years. Our hospital is a tertiary care non-academic medical center uh, with an average daily census of approximately 200 patients. 50 of those beds are in the ICU setting and they're split between med surge, coronary care, cardiothoracic surgery, and neurosurgery. Today I'll be outlining our approach to early goal-directed therapy for sepsis and septic shock, and I'll also describe how we've incorporated rapid diagnostic systems into our daily practice to improve infection-related outcomes. In 2013, the CDC published a report of antibiotic resistance threats in the U.S. Bacteria were grouped into one of three categories, including urgent, serious, and concerning. The organisms that you see highlighted on the, in yellow on the screen were all detected by at least one of the film array panels, which is the system that we've implemented at, at our facility. In February of this year, the World Health Organization also published a list of priority pathogens that pose the greatest threat to public health. This list was developed in an effort to guide research and development of new antibiotics. Carbapenem-resistant organisms were listed as critical threats since they're often resistant to most antibiotic classes and they're often associated with higher rates of mortality and increased length of stay. So although rapid diagnostic studies often focus on the time to initiation of therapy, early detection of CRE and Clostridium difficile and other multidrug resistant organisms can also lead to more rapid containment of those pathogens as well as in prevention of cross transmission. And so there are also important implications for infection prevention and control. Starting this year, our stewardship team developed source-specific antibiograms for the sources listed on the screen, in addition to bone and cerebral spinal fluid. And while gram-positive organisms constitute the majority of our bacteremia cases, you can see that around 7% of patients with E. coli urinary tract infections also had concurrent bacteremia due to the same organism. 
In the second column, you can see that MRSA and Pseudomonas were the two most common isolates detected from any respiratory source. And so we found that stratifying antibiogram data based on both source and location has helped to guide our empiric therapy in patients with both sepsis and septic shock. Compared to other bacterial infections, we saw relatively few cases of candidemia in 2016. Candida albicans was the causative pathogen in nearly half of the cases. In 13 of the 15 episodes of fungemia that occurred last year, the same isolate was detected via PCR. Uh, on one occasion, a candida species was detected that was not included on the BioFire PCR panel. And as we'll discuss later, time to initiation of antifungal therapy is especially important in patients who present with candidemia. In most cases of sepsis and septic shock, empiric antifungal therapy with agents like mycofungin or fluconazole are often delayed until the yeast is identified in the blood. And even then, as most of you know, the species may not be detected for another 24 to 48 hours. So rapid diagnostic systems have allowed us to identify candida species that are often azole resistant, like candida glabrata or cruciae, in as little as one hour from the time that a test is performed. Bloodstream infections due to candida parapsilosis may also have reduced susceptibility to a kind of candens. And in both of those examples, early transition to the most effective agent within 24 hours of presentation can really have a significant uh, impact on patient outcomes. Congress had previously recognized the need to combat antibiotic resistance, and in fiscal year 2016, they appropriated nearly $160 million in new funding for the CDC to implement activities listed in the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria. That amount was nearly doubled the following year, and among the goals that were listed in the National Action Plan, they recommended to advance the development and use of rapid diagnostic systems. The President's FY18 budget released in May did include several cuts to the programs. However, lawmakers from both parties have each indicated that many of the proposed budget cuts were unlikely to be included in the final version. So many of you listening today have probably participated in recent CMS or Joint Commission inspections. And both, organisms, uh, both organizations now require hospitals to establish and maintain effective antimicrobial stewardship programs to improve both antibiotic use and to reduce the incidence of Clostridium difficile and other multidrug resistant organism infections. Guidelines for implementing an antibiotic stewardship program from both IDSA and SHEA also support interventions that reduce antibiotic consumption while at the same time using the shortest effective duration of therapy. And according to the authors of these guidelines, the availability of rapid diagnostic systems is expected to increase and so therefore ASPs must develop processes to, to assist clinicians in interpreting as well as responding appropriately to those results. In March of 2017, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign published new recommendations to help guide early goal-directed therapy in patients with sepsis-induced organ dysfunction or septic shock. CMS also developed the CEP-1 core measure to improve compliance with each of the three and six-hour bundle elements, which closely mimic the Surviving Sepsis Campaign guidelines. In this case, two or more sets of blood cultures should be collected prior to initiating antibiotics, and all necessary blood cultures may be drawn together according to the guidelines. The author, authors also state that rapid molecular diagnostics may allow for earlier diagnosis, but clinical experience remains limited. So sepsis and septic shock are, are considered, considered medical emergencies as evidenced by the mortality rate of nearly 40% in patients with refractory hypotension and elevated lactic acid levels. Early initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy is, is really imperative in this patient population, pr preferably within the first hour of presentation, or what some have called the golden hour of severe sepsis. Patients are often started empirically on two to three broad-spectrum antibiotics, but ongoing use of combination therapy when culture and susceptibility data are available is, is really not recommended. And so in addition to routine culture data, Rapid diagnostic test results may be used for de-escalation if the resistance phenotype can be detected. Antibiotic regimens may also be converted to a single agent based on the, on the basis of gram-positive or gram-negative organism detection in at least one of the panels. So these are two examples of studies demonstrating the impact of delayed therapy in patients with septic shock or candida bloodstream infections. On the left-hand side of the screen, overall survival was reported as 79.9%. If effective antimicrobial therapy was initiated within the first hour of septic shock, for every additional hour after hypotension onset, overall survival was reduced by approximately 
On the right side of the screen, you can see the impact of delayed antifungal therapy in patients with candidemia. And the mortality rate in this case increased from 15% on culture day zero when cultures were obtained up to 41% by day three and beyond. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to focus on processes that were developed at St. Joseph Hospital and their impact on infection-related outcomes. We implemented the BioFire Film Array PCR system at our facility in January of 2015. There are currently four panels that are available for syndromic testing. For the respiratory panel, a specimen is obtained via a nasal pharyngeal swab, and that test is capable of detecting up to 17 different viruses and three bacteria that are commonly isolated in the respiratory tract. And since that test is primarily used to detect viral pathogens, we're now combining those results uh, with baseline and serial procalcitonin levels to assist with de-escalation of antibiotics. The blood culture ID panel has really been the cornerstone of our program, and I'll discuss it in more detail in the next slide. The gastrointestinal panel and the meningitis encephalitis panel are also used at our facility, but to a lesser extent. And then finally, the lower respiratory tract panel is still currently in development, uh, but it will include additional targets for antibiotic-resistant genes, including CTXM, extended spectrum beta-lactamases, or ESBLs, as well as carbapenem hydrolyzing enzymes such as KPC, OXA48, and three other metallobeta-lactamases. The blood culture ID panel is capable of detecting up to 19 bacteria, as well as five candida species from positive blood culture specimens. And it's currently the only panel uh, out of the BioFire group that can detect antibiotic resistance. The three antibiotic-resistant gene targets in this case include MEC-A for methicillin resistance among staph species, VAN-A or VAN-B for vancomycin resistance among enterococcus species, as well as the Klebsiella pneumoniae, pneumoniae carbapenemase or KPC enzyme. Our rapid molecular diagnostics protocol was developed after implementing the film array system. Positive blood cultures are initially identified using our BACT alert system and assessed via gram stain. Reflex PCR testing is then immediately performed using the BioFire blood culture ID panel. In addition to the panel, uh, routine microbiologic testing is completed, and then final culture and susceptibility results are reported in the Cerner CPOE system. When this protocol was first implemented, pediatric or small volume blood culture bottles contained activated charcoal, and those bottles were excluded from reflex PCR testing since activated charcoal may contain DNA from non-viable organisms leading to false positive test results. And also as a test, uh, cost containment strategy, if gram-positive bacilli were detected via gram stain, then reflex PCR testing would not be performed since the majority of isolates, with the exception of Listeria monocytogenes, would represent probable contaminants. The BioFi respiratory panel may be ordered separately without reflex PCR testing. De-escalation of antibiotics can occur when results are available, but this goes without saying the decision to stop antibiotics should always be based on clinical signs and symptoms of infection, as well as culture results and other serologic studies. Clinicians are usually unable to differentiate viral versus bacterial pneumonia based on chest X-ray results alone. And as you know, secondary bacterial pneumonia may be superimposed on recent viral infections. So as I mentioned earlier, we're now combining these results with baseline and serial procalcitonin levels to assist with de-escalation of antibiotics. In addition to developing the protocol and educating the microbiology staff, we also provided extensive medical staff education to accurately interpret the results and also to respond appropriately. Our team developed empiric antibiotic recommendations for each species and also for each antibiotic resistance gene pair. And since complete susceptibility profile, profiles are not known until final culture results are available, the recommendations that you see on the screen were really based on local antibiogram data from the preceding calendar year. A growing body of evidence also suggests that mandatory infectious disease consultation for complicated infections does result in greater adherence to evidence-based treatment guidelines, as well as reduced in-hospital mortality and earlier discharge. Our clinical triggers program was developed in an effort to improve both clinical and economic outcomes among patients with complicated or multi-drug resistant organism infections. ID consultation is currently required when any of the five high-risk medical conditions listed on the screen are suspected or identified in the microbiology lab. And once the clinical trigger is identified, the microbiology technician immediately notifies our ASP team using a secured email listserv. 
Once we received the notification uh, during normal hours of operation, the pharmacist would contact the IV ID office directly to initiate the consult, and then a consult order is routed directly to the hospitalist or the primary care provider for co-signature. In addition to the high-risk medical conditions uh, discussed on the previous slide, ID consultation is required for patients with documented multidrug-resistant organism infections, including those caused by carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE, ESBL-producing organisms, multidrug-resistant Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas, as well as vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus species. And that notification process that I outlined on the previous slide is the same one that we use for multidrug-resistant organisms. On July 10th of this year, we implemented the adult code sepsis policy to improve early recognition of treat and treatment of patients who present to the emergency department with either sepsis or septic shock. This was really an extension of some previous work that we had done in this area. As I mentioned earlier, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, in collaboration with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, adopted the SEP1 core measure to improve overall rates of compliance with evidence-based practices that we now know collectively as the sepsis treatment bundles. And there was also previous evidence to support the use of the code sepsis response team. You can see on the slide, code sepsis team members include the ED attending physician, the ED triage nurse, as well as the charge nurse, the on-call clinical pharmacist or pharmacy resident, and then also laboratory or phlebotomy. Ultimately, our goals are to ensure rapid identification of both sepsis and septic shock, we also want to facilitate early initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy and meet the expectations of the SEP1 core measure. So every patient who presents to our emergency department is initially screened for the presence of two or more SERS criteria and or hypotension at the time of triage. The ED attending is notified immediately when two or more SERS criteria are present, and the patient is then assigned to a room. The ED attending determines if there is a suspected source of infection. Code sepsis alerts can be activated when multiple SERS criteria are present and there is a documented or suspected infection. Any member of the code uh, sepsis response team may initiate an alert by dialing the emergency number on one of our hospital phones. A uh, process is very similar to what you might see with code blue or rapid response or code stroke at your facilities. The phlebotomist who responds to best bedside is also responsible for collecting a comprehensive metabolic panel as well as a CBC with auto differential lactic acid level with reflex if indicated, and then two sets of blood cultures. So in order to achieve a perfect score with the SEP1 core measure, all three and six hour bundle elements listed on the screen must be completed within each of their respective time frames. And so although CMS defines time of presentation as the time when all criteria are met, our own internal compliance is based on time of triage, slightly more stringent approach but it's also a practice that's supported by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. And after routine labs are collected, the on-call clinical pharmacist or the pharmacy resident will then assist the ED provider with antibiotic selection based on antibiogram data and even any previous culture results, as well as IV fluid resuscitation. The other six-hour bundle elements are also completed for patients with initial lactate values greater than two millimoles per liter, or if hypotension persists after adequate fluid resuscitation. So this table includes preliminary data that we collected after code sepsis policy uh, was implemented on July 10th. The first column you see includes patients who presented to the emergency department with sepsis-induced organ dysfunction or septic shock one year prior to start date. The second column includes patients who presented to the ED after the policy was implemented but who did not have a code sepsis alert activated. And then finally, column three on the far right includes patients who had a code sepsis alert activated in the ED. So our sample size is relatively small to date, but we have seen a marked improvement in SEP1 bundle compliance, as well as perfect score containment. The study is ongoing, but uh, other clinical and economic outcome measures uh, will be included in our final analysis, including in-hospital mortality, overall and ICU length of stay, 30-day readmission, as well as total cost per case. Our sepsis committee has really focused on the provision of consistent, high-quality patient care since 2013, and so our observed versus expected mortality ratios are now consistently below one, indicating that patients who present to our facility are surviving, which is our ultimate goal. 
So a major focus of the, initi of the initiative is also to facilitate early initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy, since that's such a strong predictor of survival in this population. The red line that you see represents the overall time from ED triage to administration of broad-spectrum antibiotics. That overall time has been reduced uh, by approximately one half from a peak in April of this year down to 79 minutes in August. And in fact, the median time to initiation of antibiotics was reduced down to 68 minutes through the first half of September. So we continue to see positive results. So in order to measure the impact of reflex PCR testing and automatic ID consultation, we also wanted to investigate a co cohort of patients with documented bacteremia. So this is a retrospective observational cohort study, objectives to determine the clinical and economic impact of reflex testing, and then also to determine the impact on time to speciation and time to uh, initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy. Patients were included in the study if they were greater than or equal to 18 years of age with microbiological evidence of either gram-positive or gram-negative bacteremia. Our positive blood cultures had to be identified or obtained within 48 hours of admission, which would more accurately reflect organisms that were isolated in the community. Patients were excluded if death, transfer to hospice, or implementation of comfort care measures occurred within 48 hours of admission. Organisms also identified as possible contaminants were not included in the study cohort. So as you can see, baseline demographics, including age, race, gender, and body weight, were similar between groups. And with the exception of diabetes, both co cohorts were also equally matched with regard to pre-existing medical conditions. Primary source of infection was the urinary tract in approximately 70% of patients, followed by intra-abdominal infections, pneumonia, skin and skin structure infections, and then catheter-related bloodstream infections. The total percentage of gram-negative isolates that produced an ESBL was higher in the post-policy cohort, although that difference was not statistically significant. And finally, we used age-adjusted Charleston comorbidity index, as well as sequential organ failure assessment scores and requirement for ICU admission as markers of disease severity. Severity of illness scores in this case were also similar between, group, between groups. Preliminary clinical and economic outcome measures were reported here for patients with gram-negative bacteremia. Cases with documented gram-positive bacteremia will also be added to each cohort, but data collection is still ongoing. The reduction that we observed in all-cause in-hospital mortality was not statistically significant, which may have been affected by a relatively small sample size to date. Overall, an ICU length of stay were significantly reduced by approximately 1.2 days and 2.9 days, respectively, and the difference in total cost per case was reduced by approximately $3,500 in the post-policy cohort. So finally, in order to tie all of these initiatives together, I wanted to present a brief case presentation. And so uh, if you could just think about uh, the initiatives that we've implemented with the code sepsis policy, clinical triggers policy, the biofire rapid diagnostics system, and then our overall approach to antimicrobial stewardship. So JR is a 63-year-old white male who presented to the emergency department with acute hypoxic respiratory failure, hypotension, acute kidney injury, confusion, and somnolence, as well as worsening left knee pain and swelling. The patient received a steroid injection three days prior to admission for treatment of left knee pain. The patient was brought to our emergency department after his family noticed increased confusion. To past medical history, as well as past surgical history, including a no total knee arthroplasty, lithotripsy, as well as fistula repair. If you'll focus on the right side of the screen, you can see that vitals that were present at the time of triage included an initial heart rate greater than 100 at 104, as well as a respiratory rate of 30, systolic pressure of 81, and a MAP of 56 millimeters of mercury. The patient was intubated for acute respiratory failure. At that time, the ED triage nurse identified that multiple surge criteria were present, escalated that to the physician, uh, the ED att attending physician who was in the ED at that time, and he documented a suspected infection, and so a code sepsis alert was activated. Once the team responded, the phlebotomist uh, collected two sets of blood cultures as well as a synovial fluid culture. They also collected a CMP, CBC with auto differential, and a lactic acid level with reflex that's indicated. Antibiotics were selected uh, after discussion with the ED attending physician, which included ceftriaxone, 2 grams, STAT administered first, followed by a weight-based vancomycin dosing regimen. 
Pharmacists also assisted in collection of the patient's uh, estimated body weight and initiation of IV fluid resuscitation with 30 mL per kilo of acrylate fluid uh, over two hours. In this case, the CMS criteria for septic shock included a, an initial temperature of 104 with elevated heart rate and respiratory rate, as well as a white blood cell count uh, greater than 12, it's initially reported as 22.3. patient was hypotensive with a MAP of 56, and he did present with initial acute kidney injury and an elevated serum creatinine of 4. The lactic acid level uh, was first reported as 4.4, which by itself would qualify as septic shock according to the CMS case definition. And then he also had acute respiratory failure. After initiating IV fluids, the patient did not respond, and so norepinephrine was eventually started. In this case, blood cultures were drawn at baseline, uh, which revealed gram-positive coccyne clusters in four of four bottles. Uh, those were identified 14 hours and 26 minutes from the time that blood cultures were collected. Uh, so one hour after uh, identifying gram-positive cocci and clusters on gram stain, the BCID panel was performed and Staphylococcus aureus was detected. Uh, you can see at the bottom the MEK-A gene was not detected, indicating that this would be methicillin-susceptible Staph aureus or MRS, uh, MSSA. And this was 15 hours and 45 minutes from the time of culture collection. At that time, the microbiology lab notified the ASP team of uh, presence of bacteremia, and so we immediately contacted the ID office directly to initiate the ID consult and to get them on board and seeing the patient. The micro lab also notified the nurse to follow up with the primary care physician or hospitalist. You can see on the right-hand side, ID, uh, the ID consult physician responded at 19 hours and 33 minutes from the time of blood culture collection. Uh, once we had culture results back, we de-escalated antibiotics from combination regimen containing ceftriaxin and vancomycin to cefazolin uh, as a 2-gram IV times 1 loading dose, followed by a continuous infusion that was adjusted based on the patient's renal dysfunction. So the first microscan uh, that was reported actually came back as MRSA, and so hence the name, the case of the faulty system. This was reported at 66 hours and 18 minutes after blood culture collection. A repeat microscan report uh, was performed, uh, which did also identify MSSA and confirm the initial PCR results. And then also the synovial fluid culture revealed MSSA, uh, which was the primary source of infection. This patient did survive until discharge, Overall, would, would normally be considered a high risk for mortality, but with all of those initiatives kind of coming together and, and adequately recognizing and treating the infection, uh, we were able to meet all of these step one bundle elements, and uh, we had a, a successful outcome in the patient. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Judd. That was fascinating. Uh, I, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I probably have about 15 questions I've already uh, written down myself, but uh, we're not going to interrupt the flow of things, and we're going to move right on to Tristan's presentation. And since I've had a preview, I can tell you inter alia, one of the things I took away from, and I'm sure you will too, is the importance of a whole systems approach to uh, fully leveraging this new technology. Um, but I'll turn it over to Tristan now to uh, enlighten you. Thanks, and thanks, Dr. Joe, for that good presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, calling out from uh, University of Utah today. Uh, I'll be talking about um, animal culture stewardship and rapid diagnostics and sort of the integral relationship between the two in bloodstream infections. Uh, those are my disclosures. So sort of an outline. Uh, first off, I'll start off talking about um, my early personal career with uh, animal colloidal stewardship and biofire uh, rapid diagnostics and bloodstream infections. Uh, then I'll look at a couple of uh, studies that use the BCID along with uh, stewardship um, and sort of the outcomes related to that. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about a meta-analysis uh, that I did that sort of looked at the clinical impact of rapid diagnostics and stewardship, uh, particularly in bloodstream infections. So just to sort of give uh, context um, and orient uh, the audience, uh, looking at sort of the impact of rapid diagnostics and bloodstream infections as far as how the uh, flow uh, within the microbiology lab works and some opportunities for stewardship. Uh, if you look at this, 
It, the gray sort of represents the conventional microbiology, so a blood specimen uh, gets to the microbiology lab. It's put up into the incubator. Uh, it takes about 8 to 24 hours for positive culture, although sometimes it takes up to five days. Uh, immediately after that, they'll do a gram stain, and then it can be another 24 to 72 hours for uh, identification of susceptibilities. The really nice thing about uh, using rapid diagnostics, particularly the uh, BioFire BCID, is uh, you're able to go directly from that positive culture when it comes to, once it comes off the incubator, and within an hour, you're able to get identification of the organism and then also just genetic resistance markers to really be able to use stewardship to optimize therapy for those patients uh, with those critical illnesses. So, uh, again, to sort of um, start out, I wanted to sort of give a background of my early experience with uh, rapid diagnostics and bloodstream infections uh, along with stewardship. Uh, I was really fortunate during my residency training. I uh, trained at uh, Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. Uh, it's about a 709-bed academic medical center. Um, and we were really an early adopter of the BioFire film array for uh, blood culture infections. Uh, it, it was approved about the summer of 2013, and we actually uh, took it online in about December of 2013. And within about a week of um, us turning on the system and going live with it, uh, we had this case of uh, this 21-year-old female uh, she's a cystic fibrosis patient, and she presented uh, in endorsing some subjective low-grade fevers, uh, increased speed in production for a few days, uh, and obviously being a CF patient, she had had many hospitalizations and a history of multidrug resistant organism infections. Uh, whenever she presented, she was actually a febrile. However, she did have an elevated heart rate and respiratory rate and O2 requirements, um, and then also some positive findings on physical examination uh, for respiratory. Uh, so we got uh, blood cultures, uh, one from a portocath and one from the periphery. Uh, a chest x-ray uh, reflected that she had uh, left lower lobe consolidation, uh, potentially suggestive of pneumonia. Uh, we continued her home regimen of uh, tobramycin and azithromycin, uh, along with consulting pulmonary, that being that she was a CF patient, uh, and initiating vancomycin, piptazo, and tobramycin IV. Uh, on day two, the portocath uh, blood culture was actually positive, um, and upon gram stain, it revealed uh, GPCs and clusters, uh, so sort of suggestive of a staph infection. Uh, however, conversely, whenever we ran the film array BCID, we actually found six organisms. Uh, this included uh, Canada species, uh, two Canada species, a Pseudomonas species, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Enterococcus species, and a Streptococcus species. Um, and then, in addition to that, uh, being that the film array can detect uh, genetic resistance mechanisms, we detected a uh, MEC-A suggestive of an uh, MRSA infection and a VAN-A suggestive of a uh, uh, VRE. Uh, so really a strong discordance between what was on the gram stain and then uh, what the film array was showing. And again, we had only been running this a week, so we were all kind of standing around scratching our heads going, wow, is this, you know, what's going on? So uh, we ended up pulling the um, blood culture, re-reviewed the gram stain, looked at some more high-powered fields, um, and we were able to find GPCs and chains, uh, sort of suggestive of the enterococcus, and then also one budding yeast to sort of uh, reflect that we actually did have a Canada infection. Uh, so this is the timeline of uh, sort of the identification and treatment of that patient uh, and some optimizations that we were able to make with our stewardship program along with the uh, blood culture identification uh, from film array. Uh, so if you note, um, really on day two, whenever we had those positives, uh, we were able to make a lot of optimizations that if you look at the asterisks when uh, susceptibilities came back, uh, we wouldn't have been able to um, really make those optimizations as soon if we didn't have the BCID. So some of the things that we did was change vancomycin to DAPTO for VRE, uh, linazolid uh, initiation for pneumonia coverage, uh, mycophon for Canada species, and then also, based off of the previous susceptibilities for that patient, uh, switch Piptazolo to Cipro for the Pseudomonas species. So the patient uh, was treated successfully for two weeks. Uh, the uh, film array really allowed for early targeted therapy that wouldn't have been possible uh, if we had just relied on gram stain, or also if we were using some other rapid diagnostic technologies that are directed by gram stain. Uh, so at least for me, this really spoke to the clinical utility early in my career of these rapid diagnostic technologies, particularly in bloodstream infections, along with stewardship to sort of facilitate those results to make sure that early optimization of therapy occurred. 
Uh, not only that, but also um, this case sort of reflected to me a potential advantage of the BCID in identifying polymicrobial bloodstream infections. So if you look in the literature, there's about 5 to 15% of bloodstream infections are uh, reported as polymicrobial. And we went back and looked at um, our hospital, and of the 200, first 215 blood cultures that we did, uh, approximately 11% of those were actually polymicrobial. So um, sort of transitioning into some of the clinical outcomes data that's been reported for BCID um, uh, in bloodstream infection, along with stewardship. Uh, the first study I wanted to talk about today uh, was from Banerjee et al. out of Mayo. Uh, this was a really nice study uh, where they did a randomized control trial uh, looking at the benefit of BCID and then also looking at the benefit of um, basically adding stewardship to the BCID. So they split it up into three uh, randomized arms. Uh, the conventional testing, which I will note, they actually had Malditoff in. Uh, they did plate those to an agar plate, so it did require overnight incubation. Uh, however, that is also much faster than uh, conventional microbiology workup uh, in most labs. Um, however, they compared that to uh, the BCID with uh, templated comments, uh, so sort of relying on uh, the primary team to um, utilize those results, and then uh, a third arm that used the templated comments, the BCID result, and then also a real-time stewardship intervention. And they looked at sort of, you know, the bread and butter outcomes of bloodstream infections, including durations of therapy, time to de-escalation or escalation, length of stay, uh, mortality and cost. Uh, so looking at their different uh, randomization arms, uh, there was about 200 patients per arm. Uh, they were uh, able to show the uh, time to de was much less uh, using the BCID. It decreased by about 21 hours. Um, and then looking at their time to de-escalation or escalation, uh, it was actually shortest uh, among the BCID uh, plus stewardship, um, and that was statistically significant. Um, However, there was no difference in mortality, length of stay, or cost. Uh, however, those weren't really um, their main endpoints that they were looking for. Particularly, mortality wasn't really powered for that. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, really looking at this, at least the way that this study speaks to me, is uh, the addition of uh, stewardship to blood culture identification, the rapid blood culture identification, really improves patient care uh, because uh, really they were able to drive de escalations much earlier whenever they added stewardship to the BCID results. So now I'll transition to another study that sort of looked at a similar way, but a different sort of fashion. Um, this is from McVean et al., and this is actually out of um, the institution that I trained at uh, down in Charleston. So they looked at it, again, sort of a different way. They had uh, basically the same sort of format, except uh, one, it wasn't a randomized control trial, this was an observational study, but two, uh, Banerjee added stewardship to the blood culture identification to see the, the benefit of adding stewardship. And at Medical University of South Carolina, after uh, we started our stewardship program, uh, one of our initial um, interventions was to monitor bloodstream infections before we had rapid diagnostics. So this study really, um, they added the blood culture identification uh, diagnostics um, for the BCID after we had already started to routinely monitor bloodstream infections. So it sort of is different uh, than the Banerjee because it looks at it at different angles as far as the incremental benefit of rapid diagnostics and stewardship um, because this is able to show when you add BCID to stewardship uh, for blood culture infections, uh, does that really show the benefit or is it vice versa or is it both? So uh, they had about 100 patients per arm in uh, the McVeigh study. Uh, showed also decrease in time to identification, like Banerjee. Um, their time to de-escalation or escalation uh, was shortest among the BCID plus uh, ASP arm, so decreasing even more than just stewardship routinely monitoring blood cultures. So again, sort of suggesting that it's not one or the other, but it's really the combination of both um, rapid diagnostics and stewardship. Um, so again, the conclusion of that is that uh, the addition of uh, blood culture identification, rapid diagnostics to stewardship and crews to patient care and bloodstream infections. So looking at those two studies, it, at least to me, is clear that rapid diagnostics, such as biofire film array, uh, along with stewardship, improves patient management and bloodstream infections. Uh, there's been multiple studies that have really shown this decreased time to effective therapy and de-escalations. Um, which can also uh, promote avoidance of uh, bacterial resistance and adverse effects of medications. Uh, some other studies have actually shown decreases in length of stay and mortality. Uh, so, you know, 
about a year or two ago, I started to think, you know, all these different studies, you know, what is the overall data out there within the literature as far as the impact of rapid diagnostics on bloodstream infections? And then particularly uh, the combination of stewardship within that uh, sort of paradigm of uh, what sort of benefit is there to clinical outcomes. So with that thought, um, I went ahead and performed uh, with uh, my research group up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, um, a meta-analysis of uh, the impact of molecular rapid diagnostics in improving clinical outcomes in bloodstream infections. Um, and we were basically looking at studies that had outcomes between uh, molecular rapid diagnostics, or MRDT, uh, and conventional methods in bloodstream infections. Uh, and as far as outcomes, we looked for overall mortality risk, uh, the mortality risk in studies with uh, stewardship, uh, so, sort of a subgroup uh, stratification, uh, a mortality risk about organisms. So I know that, at least in my experience, I've read some of the literature where certain groups will only run rapid diagnostics on bloodstream infections because they don't necessarily believe that it, there was a benefit in gram negatives. Uh, so sort of trying to uh, tease out whether or not there is a benefit there. Um, also, time to effective therapy, so sort of speaking to the plausibility behind the mortality, so sort of like what Dr. Judd talked about earlier, the importance of time to effective therapy and translating into those mortality benefits. Uh, and then finally, length of stay. So we did a uh, search of PubMed, Sinol, Web Science, Embase uh, from inception to uh, May of 2016, and we looked at keywords related to bloodstream infections and rapid diagnostics. Uh, we included any sort of uh, rapid diagnostics, um, and if you really sort of dig into the definitions of what are rapid diagnostics, it's really kind of hard to tease out like a time cutoff, so we included anything that had results uh, within 24 hours. So even if they used a multi-top and they played it overnight and they were able to, you know, take an identification off an 18-hour uh, plated agar, uh, we would go ahead and include those as well. Uh, we excluded non-English studies, uh, any studies looking at anything that was uh, not sort of routine bacterial uh, bloodstream infections. And then also there are some technologies out there, uh, particularly in Europe, that look at um, running basically broad PCR on negative blood cultures, uh, and we excluded those as well. Uh, so there were two reviewers, myself and uh, one of my colleagues. We had a third reviewer that uh, sort of um, uh, resolved disagreements as far as inclusion and exclusion. Uh, we critically appraised individual, uh, the body of studies using um, RevMan, which is a uh, software tool available from the Cochrane Group. Uh, and we use a random effects model, so basically saying that there are uh, differences among these studies uh, that aren't related to necessarily measurement effects. It's really study design that could be different. Um, however, they have some uh, similarities as far as their outcomes. Uh, and it sort of adjusts based off of... Um, sort of deviations from uh, the average uh, between each study. Um, and then we looked at uh, the bias on between studies using the Newcastle Auto Scale, uh, looked for publication bias. Uh, we also analyzed heterogeneity uh, using a variety of different methods. So uh, after we did our literature search, we ended up including 31 studies, and that was about 6,000 patients. Uh, and as far as the results, uh, we found that molecular lab diagnostics uh, reduced the risk of mortality uh, with an odds ratio of 0.66. Uh, and if you look at the four spot that's uh, at the very bottom, uh, diamond, that uh, shows that result. Uh, and using that result, uh, really to be able to speak to some non-statistical sort of people or uh, even clinical people, so if you were to go to your C-suite and say, you know, we really think this will benefit our patients. Uh, we went ahead and calculated a number needed to treat based off of that odds ratio. So what that says is if you run this test uh, in 20 people, uh, depending on your patient population and your empiric therapy of prescribing patterns, at least based off the data that we had, it would take running 20 tests uh, to decrease mortality by one. So, uh, for instance, if the test takes about $150 uh, a test to run, it would you could say to your C-suite, it takes about $3,000 to decrease mortality with this particular technology. Um, and then finally, uh, we did a subgroup analysis, again, by uh, studies that had stewardship versus studies that did not. And we defined that by an ID uh, physician responding or a pharmacist responding to those uh, rapid diagnostic results. Um, and we really showed that um, the stewardship studies had a statistically significant benefit uh, whereas the ones that didn't have that didn't uh, reach significance. 
Uh, however, overall, uh, whenever you combine all of the studies, there was a significant uh, difference uh, as far as uh, decreased mortality. So again, uh, going back to sort of the plausibility uh, behind all of this decreased mortality is time to effective therapy. Uh, and whenever you pull uh, all of the studies that reported time to effective therapy, so that wasn't all 31 studies that had that um, time to effective therapy reported, uh, but of the ones that did, it decreased uh, time to effective therapy by about five hours. So again, sort of speaking to uh, what Dr. Judd had talked about earlier, uh, the Kumar study that shows uh, about a 7.6% uh, reduction in mortality uh, for every hour to effective therapy and subject shock. So some other outcomes that we I didn't show, but that we had in uh, that uh, study. Uh, again, we looked at gram-positive and gram-negative as subgroups, and there were mortality benefits in both of those that were significant. Um, and then length of stay decreased by about two and a half days. Uh, so basically, uh, the conclusion that I drove from that was that rapid diagnostics uh, and antimicrobial stewardship should really be the standard of care to uh, ensure that improved management of antimicrobial therapy happens in these patients with bloodstream infections. So uh, I also wanted to include a few other more recent studies that have came out that I really uh, feel like speak to this incremental benefit between rapid diagnostics and stewardship. Uh, Donner et al. was a, um, a mock case study that uh, came out of uh, Nebraska, and basically they showed physicians mock cases with rapid diagnostic results um, and asked them to make interpretations on um, uh, treatment for those patients uh, for the mock cases, and about 14 to 48 percent incorrectly uh, interpreted the rapid diagnostics. So really speaking to that these diagnostics are very sometimes uh, nuanced and Unless you have the specialized knowledge of those nuances, or you have a you know a friend like through stewardship to help with those, um, you might not always adequately use the rapid diagnostics. Uh, another group uh, out of Colorado, Mescar et al. Uh, also did an interesting study where they they were actually looking at pediatrics, so um, looking at rapid diagnostics and the benefit there. But one of the interesting things that they did, they did a, uh, a survey of physicians that had unsolicited stewardship interventions, and asked them how satisfied they were. And the mean satisfaction was 4.0 out of 5.0 uh, on Likert scale. So basically suggesting that um, physicians really appreciate stewardship, uh, making interventions and recommendations and helping with those rapid diagnostic interpretations. And then finally, a, a recent study from Foster et al. This is a survey of uh, pharmacists on rapid diagnostic awareness. And basically they showed an association between formal ID training and an increased familiarity with rapid diagnostics. So together, all of these things sort of speak to, at least to me, as far as the conclusion is that you really need uh, formerly ID trained pharmacists um, in stewardship programs. Uh, and they're not only needed, but they're also valued by physicians uh, to sort of facilitate timely and appropriate use of rapid diagnostic results, particularly in bloodstream infections. So I also wanted to include, uh, sort of speaking to this uh, paradigm uh, of this relationship between rapid diagnostics and stewardship. Uh, this great figure, again, uh, a different study that um, was from Mescar uh, et al. And he created this really awesome figure that sort of shows that, it, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship between rapid diagnostics and stewardship. Um, and so you really need stewardship uh, to really facilitate um, good rapid diagnostic use. So to conclude, I... Uh, to really speak better to it than I uh, could come up with, uh, this is a quote... Um, from uh, Christopher Dorn, a microbiologist at um, uh, University of Health System in Virginia. He said, if we are serious about improving patient care, then we will learn from what McVeigh and Nolte, Banerjee et al. have found, which is better outcomes come not just from better diagnostics, and not better stewardship, but from the combination of the two. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator. Thank you, Tristan. Um... We have a couple of questions for the audience. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to clarify at the outset with both the presenters is the question that at your institutions and in most of these studies cited, are rapid testing protocols being utilized that only get triggered after a positive blood culture is appreciated in the laboratory, or are they doing it more immediately? The question came to my mind as a clinician, you know, what is zero hour at your hospitals and in these studies? For us, for us at St. Joe, uh, currently our policy states that uh, the PCR testing would only be performed for positive blood cultures, which I believe is still currently the only uh, FDA-approved 
uh, indication or time when, when PCR testing would be performed for the BCID panel. Uh, we are looking into potentially earlier PCR testing for patients who present to our ED with septic shock who have other risk factors for bacteremia. And so, for example, we found that those with pyelonephritis uh, and septic shock had, had greater risk for bacteremia, and we've considered uh, targeting those patients, but uh, we have not started anything formally yet. How about you, Tristan? Uh, I'll just uh, mirror uh, what Dr. Judd said. Um, and currently, based off the FDA approval, uh, you know, that's how the film array and some of the other uh, technologies work is running on positive blood cultures. Uh, there are some up-and-coming technologies that look at um, basically patients that are septic and running uh, sort of broad-spectrum PCR on those. Um, however, uh, at least for bacterial, there aren't any FDA-approved ones in the United States, uh, so we're currently not doing that uh, for patients in our hospital. Yeah, it's fascinating. I was just struck by some of the Canada data where, you know, roughly speaking, every hour uh, you're behind the curve, you're you're raising the mortality rate by about 10%. I was really kind of struck by that. I could kind of see that going in that direction. Okay, uh, our first question is from um, Tyler Whitkes in uh, St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital. Have you noticed any discrepancies between film aware results and your confirmatory laboratory. For example, we had an ID uh, uh, case if, uh, with salmonella, but confirmatory culture came back negative. How would you suggest handling a situation like this? For us, uh, I, I'm aware of about 15, 10 to 15 cases where we saw discordant results between our microscan report and the initial PCR result. Uh, in all, or I would say, at least 14 or in maybe all of those cases, uh, the repeat, my repeat microscan was performed, which confirmed the original PCR result. Uh, we did have one case of candidemia a couple of years ago where candida albicans was detected via PCR and we, and we uh, received a different report and were, uh, by microscan and we were unable to confirm the original PCR result. But I would say for the most part, uh, PCR for us has been very reliable. Uh, and again, I'll sort of uh, mirror uh, Russ on that. Um, at least in my experience, we haven't had a lot of discordance uh, ones whenever I was at Medical University of South Carolina. Obviously, the uh, case report that uh, we published on was a very major discordance and um, that sort of spoke to the benefit of having the PCRs. The PCR in some cases are more reliable than conventional microbiology methods. Um, I know there are some reports of discordances between, uh, say, MRSA and MSSA, so you could have a, a MEK positive um, that uh, wouldn't necessarily be um, MRSA because it could be a dysfunctional gene, but I, I know those are extremely rare. Okay. Uh, Teresa Robertson um, at the VA asks, what does lactic acid reflux to in your protocols? Yeah, so that's that's something we developed uh, last year. It's called the lactic acid level with reflex if indicated. And as you know, for the CEP1 core measure, initial lactate, lactic acid levels have to be collected within three hours. And if the initial level is greater than two, a repeat level must be obtained within six hours of presentation. And so at the time, we were consistently falling out on that second lactic acid level. Uh, we designed this order so that if, if the physician uses it, uh, and the initial level is greater than two, the system would automatically order a second level with a two-hour offset. And the, you have to give the provider uh, the option to choose an order without reflex testing. But uh, for us, almost all of our ED physicians at this point are using the reflex level, and it, we're now at 100% compliance with that specific CEP1 bundle element. Uh, Jennifer Bowie in uh, Upper Chesapeake Medical Center asked, if BioFire indicates enterobacteria with E. coli at her institution, normally the antibiogram uh, showing a sensitivity to ceftriaxone in a severely septic patient, would you de-escalate or wait until final blood culture results were available to de-escalate? Uh, for us, we would... Specifically for gram-negative bacteremia cases, uh, unless we know the resistance phenotype, we do wait until final culture results are available. In the, the case uh, example that I gave during the presentation, I talked about 
a patient with Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia, but we knew the resistant phenotype. It was MECA negative and confirmed as MSSA, so we were able to de-escalate. But for a lot of our gram-negative isolates in the blood, we usually do wait. And, and you know, we tailor our regimens to the patient's clinical response uh, to, to the treatment regimen. Uh, so, oh, go ahead, Tristan. Go ahead. Uh, in my experience, we typically, if you know, it's a patient that's in septic shock, um, and definitely one of the gram negatives where you're going more off the antibiogram than uh, genetic resistance markers. Um, you know, if they're on pressors, again, sort of defaulting to this is a laboratory result and sort of taking the overall clinical picture that we really don't have margin of error. Uh, we haven't, at least in my experience, de-escalated whenever those patients are that critically ill. Uh, I'll sort of, um, in contrast to that, look at, say, like a patient that comes in with a UTI bacteremia. Um, and, you know, those patients usually defervesce very quickly. Um, so if it's a floor patient um, and, you know, it's an E. coli um, and it's not something where they've been, you know, risk factors for SPLs as far as travel history or anything like that, you know this patient, uh, we have routinely de-escalated based off of our antibiogram. So it really comes down to the patient-specific situation, at least for my experience. Okay, Ken Nagashi, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Carrie. A uh, good Sam Hostel ask, is the case where the gram stain only shows staph, but the RDS identified many organisms, were the rapid diagnostic tests confirmed by culture, ultimately? So in that particular case, uh, we were able to um, actually pull out uh, those organisms uh, in culture, um, we actually had to do some special um, modifications as far as the workup to get those out. So as you'll notice in the timeline, some of those were very far out as far as us being able to get those because we had to do sort of uh, purity plates and uh, separating out the different uh, isolates. Um, and, however, I'll note that was from the porticath. Uh, from the periphery, the only thing we ended up finally recovering was um, the MRSA. Um, however, with, you know, uh, say like a fungemia uh, or even an enterococcus, most of the time, most clinicians, at least in my experience, will end up uh, uh, defaulting to uh, um, sort of a conservative approach and go ahead and treating those, uh, even if they weren't recovered from the periphery. Uh, Patrick Osbolt at Ohio Health asks, for Dr. Judd, how do you approach off-hours reporting of RDTs for BCIDs? And that was a question I had logistically. How do, how do all these code sepsis protocols work? off hours, and uh, also at what point do you get an ID consultant involved, particularly during off hours? Yeah, so that, that's one area that we've struggled with, um, just having only a few dedicated FTEs to stewardship. Uh, we do have pharmacy resident coverage uh, during the evenings uh, through 9 p.m., so for results that are sent to the secure listserv during that time frame, uh, at least someone would be there to to see the result and then respond to it if indicated. Um, for the code sepsis policy in the emergency department, uh, it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Again, because pharmacy residency and clinical pharmacy coverage only extend through 9 p.m. at our facility, the pharmacist uh, may not be able to attend in person, uh, but could still respond by um, uh, in the pharmacy, in the central pharmacy, by reconciling IV fluid bolus orders and recommending appropriate therapy if if needed. Uh, Elaine Parabelli uh, asked a question I had too. Do you think it's possible in a short time to implement MRDT in a large scale? I mean, my lab processes uh, up to 4,000 urine samples per day, and for us, the instruments are not adequate for the routine usage. Will it be possible for us to implement in such a big lab routine load? Tristan, you want to take that one? Any, any takers? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know about urines. Uh, I know um, there are uh, some technologies for that, uh, at least in development. Um, uh, but I, I really haven't had a lot of uh, clinical or research experience with rapid diagnostics for urinary tract infections. Um, however, at least for blood cultures, uh, particularly for the film rate BCID, uh, I know that was sort of an issue as far as throughput for BCID, uh, or not BCID, but the film rate uh, initially. Uh, with their platform, uh, and to sort of address that, um, BioFire really, at least in my opinion, sort of stepped up, and they came out with the Torch, uh, which is uh, really expandable, sort of modular um, 
system that you're able to run, you know, a ton of isolates on simultaneously. Um, so I don't really, at least for uh, bug cultures, respiratory cultures, any of the sort of cartridge-based ones that run on uh, the film array, I don't see that as an issue. Uh, one final question I had for you all as we end up today's session, hopefully on time, is um, what's your sense of the trajectory of multidrug resistance in bloodstream infections? Because I saw that, listening to your talks, as a real opportunity to leverage this technology, and uh, I'm wondering how rapidly we're seeing multidrug resistance grow. Yeah, for, for us... Um I think our our infection control team and our stewardship practices have been very effective at, at containing multi-drug resistant isolates, especially in the blood. Um, and and since we've implemented some uh, new practices with our infection control team, uh, we've seen major actually major reductions in multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. However, uh, we do recognize that the uh, that KPCs and other metallo beta lactamases like Verona integral metallobetalactamases or New Delhi metallobetalactamases are starting to spread throughout the U.S. And if, if you compare the current epidemiology to the same epidemiology 10 years ago, uh, you know you're going from only a few states that were affected to now uh, almost every state affected. So not saying it won't come, but uh, I think rapid diagnostic tests in, in, in that, at that time will be extremely helpful. Um, I would also say that for the lower res respiratory tract panel that's in development, having specific targets for ESBLs like CTXN 14 or 15, uh, as well as the OXA 48 and the other metallobetalactamases, uh, will may potentially really change how, how we treat patients with uh, lower respiratory tract infections. I think it could be extremely beneficial. Fascinating. Well, I'm sure we're all going to keep abreast of this technology um, because we'll have to. Uh, I'd like to thank our two presenters today and uh, our many participants and especially those who submitted questions during the uh, presentation. Uh, there is a question of whether the presentation slides will be made available. Um, uh, I don't have that answer right at hand, but we'll look into that, and if they are, we'll certainly be making that information available to everybody's registered for the presentation today. Uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for participating, and have a good day.